Hello, and welcome to our webcast, Beyond Basics, Recent Developments in the Use of Aluminum Extrusion in Automotive Lightweighting. I'm Lisa Riga with SA International, your moderator for the next 60 minutes. Today we're going to discuss four key extrusion design variables and how they're being pushed to yield innovative solutions. These four variables are alloy selection and management, part geometry, tolerancing, and fabrication and joining. We'll also share several mini case studies. Throughout this webcast, audience members may send in questions by using the Ask a Question box on the screen. We'll answer as many audience questions as possible during our Q&A in the second half of the program. Questions not answered will be given to the speaker for follow-up after the webcast. You may also use the Ask a Question box to alert us to any technical problems you might have. However, if you're having trouble seeing the presentation, please make sure you have turned off your pop-up blockers. This webcast will be archived and posted on the SAE website. An email will be sent to all who registered for the program as soon as the archive is ready. In addition, you may download a PDF of today's PowerPoint slides by clicking the link on the left-hand side of your screen under Event Resources. And now, it gives me great pleasure to introduce today's speaker, Rob Nelson. Rob is a member of the Aluminum Extruders Council's automotive team. The Council is an international trade association dedicated to advancing the effective use of aluminum extrusion in North America. Rob is also the Director of Sales for Almag Aluminum and works with automotive customers on applying extrusions in new vehicle designs. He brings a strong materials experience to the task, having spent much of his career working in the automotive market with a leading steel company before joining Almag. Hello, Rob. Welcome. Thanks for being with us today. Hi, Lisa. Thank you very much. And uh, first, I'd like to welcome uh, everyone and thank everyone for uh, joining, I guess, what is uh, the AEC's third uh, presentation on aluminum extrusions, uh, this one titled Developments in the Use of Aluminum Extrusions in Lightweighting. Uh, first, first thing that we're going to look at uh, in this uh, presentation, we are going to look at uh, the situation, what the market situation is these days. And we have uh, a number of slides here uh, provided by Ducker Roll Ride, which looks at the at the market and where we see aluminum and aluminum extrusions going in the uh, in the future. So, uh, looking back in 2012, we see a nice little uh, pie chart uh, here, and we see that. 15% was was really focused on the the weight reduction back in 2012, which is, you know, coming from aluminum extrusions and other aluminum components in vehicles. Uh, but as we look towards uh, 2015, there has been some changes there, and uh, with the U.S. purchases of heavier vehicles higher than than originally anticipated. A bigger piece of that pie is going to be attributed to to lightweighting, and we're seeing that now with the release of many of these. Uh, aluminum intensive vehicles that are coming into the market. Uh, this next slide, uh, also uh, from Ducker, shows the uh, the reduction in in weight over the next 10 years. So we're looking at around 460 pounds on average uh, per vehicle uh, in order to meet the uh, 2025 CO2 uh, compliance levels. So uh, that's a considerable considerable amount of weight that uh, will be reduced out of the uh, out of the vehicle over the upcoming years. Uh, with that, we see uh, an expected uh, fairly significant wave of new program launches uh, that are going to reshape the uh, North American uh, light vehicle market uh, with the extensive uh, aluminum content. Uh, when are we going to see this uh, this extensive launch? That's over the next uh, the next three to four years. You can see there on the uh, on the on the graph below. You see. 2017, 2018, and 2019 being some uh, fairly high levels of, uh, of new program launches of vehicles, and a lot of these vehicles are uh, containing extensive aluminum content. Uh, now, with regards to aluminum shapes and extruded shapes in that vehicle content there, you can see from uh, the, the graphs uh, on the page now, you see that 
Illumina has been trending uh, fairly high with, uh, you know, we're seeing up to 350 pounds of aluminum content in a vehicle right now, where extruded shapes are ranging in around the 16 to 17 pounds uh, per vehicle currently. But as we move to 2025, we see that number growing upwards into the 40 pounds per vehicle. So taking a lot more of that uh, content uh, of aluminum extrusion shapes are going to be key in this area. Uh, continuing on here, just looking at a couple of uh, areas of the vehicle, uh, the first being the, the hood of the vehicle. Uh, you can see there the relationship back in, in 2009 from steel to aluminum, uh, majority of it was steel. And now, uh, as we look to 2015, almost 50% of the market is, is aluminum hoods, so a very strong increase in, in aluminum content in hoods of vehicles. And now what we're seeing on the, uh, on the subframe and cradle side of things, we're seeing that content increase significantly from 3% in 2009 up to 9% now. So uh, some great growth in, in, in using of aluminum extrusion and aluminum in general for, uh, for these applications. Uh, if we look at a couple of the recent uh, launches in vehicles here, uh, we look at the the body and white weight in pounds of uh, of the new F-150 truck is is definitely you can see there considerably lighter than the uh, segment competitor almost uh, 250 pounds uh, lighter just in the cab alone. Uh, similar, the uh, Tesla Model S has considerable amount of weight savings uh, by using aluminum, and then also uh, the Audi A8 up to 230 pounds of uh, of savings there of weight savings there. Uh, so more specifically on where aluminum extrusion shapes are being used in vehicles today, uh, we see the body structure components uh, being kind of the top, uh, the top hitter there, uh, where we see almost a 325% increase in the use of aluminum extrusion shapes. And what I mean by shapes are, are custom aluminum extrusion profiles specific to the application. So 325% on body structures is a, is, a, is a very large number. And then we see the, the interior seats, trim, and sunroof, and other components being uh, 67%. Another big area is suspension links and chassis is being, uh, uh, being a, top, uh, a top increaser there. So uh, going from around, four, like I said, 14 to 15 pounds per vehicle up to 38 and a half pounds per vehicle in, uh, in, in, in 2025, so uh, a great increase for aluminum extrusions in, uh, in multiple areas of the vehicle across uh, many platforms. Uh, so uh, this webinar is going to really explore of how we get uh, weight savings out of vehicles that's going to help the industry go from you know, around at 35 miles per gallon to where we're at now up to the average fleet uh, miles per gallon up to 54.5. So. Uh, with that, uh, we'll look at a quick agenda here for today. So I'm going to go over a, a brief refresher on, on material and uh, process characteristics. Uh, we'll look at key design variables, specifically looking at alloys, uh, shapes, geometry, and fabrication. And then I'll look at a case example and then uh, some additional resources towards the end of the presentation. So uh, with that, we'll look at uh, aluminum extrusion in, uh, in general and uh, We'll start now. So um, as we all know, aluminum extrusion can be formed into in many different areas. And, and with aluminum extrusion, it really allows us to, to design uh, profiles and geometry and putting material exactly where you need it. So um, if you need a flange in a certain area or a nut track or uh, some sort of heat dissipation areas with regards to heat sinks and stuff like that, we're allowed to put that material exactly where we need it. Um, it's very versatile. Uh, we can achieve near net shape uh, process for, for complex forms and also hold uh, very, very tight tolerance. So, so extrusion is a very, very uh, important characteristic uh, when regarding uh, aluminum extrusion design for vehicles. Uh, when we look at uh, the advantages of aluminum uh, extrusions here, we're going to look at the advantages of aluminum. We're also going to look at the advantages of extrusion. And I'll go through uh, not all of these. We're going to look at a couple of key components out of each one of these lists and show how it, uh, it really affects the, the automotive market. Um, the first thing here we're going to look at aluminum it has a very uh, good high uh, strength to weight ratio. So um, it's ideal for structural applications with its uh, high strength and low weight. Um, if it's properly alloyed and tempered, we can achieve uh, excellent uh, ultimate tensile strengths of, uh, 
of 80 to 90 KSI. Uh, a perfect example here is the Corvette C7. Um, is 40 kilograms lighter than its steel counterpart and also 60% uh, stiffer. Um, so that's done with uh, optimized geometry of aluminum extrusion profiles in, in many of the uh, applications on this vehicle. Uh, aluminum extrusion is very uh, corrosion resistant. Uh, it develops its own uh, inert uh, aluminum oxide film, which, which creates a, a protective layer over the aluminum. So a lot of the times uh, the extrusions can be uh, very stable in a mill finished condition. Um, it does, it, it, and this blocks the uh, further oxid, oxid, oxidization of aluminum extrusion. Um, with regards to cold strength, um, aluminum extrusion actually becomes uh, more durable uh, from a strength and ductility standpoint as the temperatures are reduced, whereas their steel and plastic counterparts uh, become brittle, brittle as the temperature drops. Uh, aluminum is uh, very uh, electric, electrically conductive. Um, on a weight basis, aluminum can be uh, twice as conductive as, uh, as copper, so uh, it, in many cases it makes good financial sense in this case. Um, from a heat conductive standpoint, uh, aluminum is, uh, is a great uh, dissipator of heat. Uh, it can, especially with, uh, with the geometry and, uh, and heat sinking capabilities that we are able to create a significant amount of surface area on aluminum extrusion profiles in order to cool the aluminum, which is then in return cooling the, uh, the heat source. So uh, definitely perfect application for aluminum for heat sinking. Now we look at the financials of aluminum itself, and just in general here, um, we all know that aluminum does cost per pound more than uh, steel on a, uh, on a on a pound per pound basis. But what we really got to focus here on is what are the advantages of the aluminum that uh, we get over steel, and and that being first of all, aluminum is uh, uh, much less dense than it's the, it's one third that of steel. Um, that provides us a, a great weight savings opportunity to, again, back to putting the material where we want to have uh, optimal geometry. Uh, and also we want to look at, uh, from an aluminum standpoint, extrusions can be designed with many features built into it where we can design nut channels and screw ports that may save uh, further manufacturing of steel applications. So, so definitely there are some, some savings there as well. And then also we have the end-of-life costs where aluminum extrusion is, is, is definitely 100% uh, re recyclable uh, from, a, from a, that standpoint. Uh, looking at the extrusion process itself, uh, we look here in the top, uh, the picture of the top in the top left. Uh, we see a billet, which is on the uh, the left hand side of that picture, and then a die set, uh, and then the the front picture of the die. And we have a multiple uh, a multiple hollow die there, and there's four hollows in this die specifically. So you have basically have your die plate, which is your first die, and then your second is the uh, is sorry, your first die is the mandrel, and the second uh, die is the die plate, and then you have some support tooling after that. So this is how the material is heated up and pushed out through the uh, through the die and it runs out onto a table at a distance of anywhere from 150 feet to probably 200 plus feet in some cases. Uh, we look down at the second picture at the bottom. Uh, sometimes for optimized uh, uh, production we can have multiple cavities in the die of the same profile so we can get uh, twice as much material out of the die uh, through one cycle of, uh, of pushing. Uh, many questions that a lot of uh, customers have for extruders is how is hollows created uh, in aluminum extrusion? And that's done, again, with two pieces. We have uh, the die plate, which is your outer ring. In this case, it's very similar to a, to a Play-Doh press here. And uh, the inside die is, uh, is the mandrel. And what happens is, is the material is, is pushed from behind that, that die plate and then pushed in and around and over top. And the material is basically squeezed back together as it exits the press. And it does come out as, uh, in, in, a, in a hollow form. Uh, we look at just an overall picture here of the of the aluminum extrusion process. So what we're going to do is we're going to heat up the billet. We're going to extrude it through the extrusion press, uh, exit temperatures in in and above 910 degrees Fahrenheit. This material now is 100. You can see from the picture there. Uh, you can see the material is very long out on the table, uh, and that is at that point then stretched 
and then it is after it's stretched, then it's cut back into more manageable lengths. Those lengths range 12 to, to 20 feet on average. And then after the material, at this point, it's very soft. And then what we need to do is, is put it into an aging oven. That's going to artificially age the material up to the point where we have some good yield and tensile properties of the aluminum extrusion. Um, now we'll look at a couple advantages of aluminum extrusions themselves. So again, uh, very suitable for complex near net shapes. Uh, you know, if, if you need to put ridges and braces into the extrusion, it's, it's not like uh, a steel tube or something like that where we can actually create internal structure inside of that tube. Um, you can see there's the geometry of many profiles uh, down below of, uh, of unique geometry. Uh, and, uh, and also, it can be produced to very close, uh, close tolerances, uh, and we'll get a little bit more in detail on tolerancing of aluminum extrusions for automotive applications here uh, towards the end of the, end of the presentation. Uh, again, uh, suitable for a wide range of finishes. Uh, aluminum can be anodized, allodyne, wet paint, powder coat. Uh, also very easy to fabricate. Uh, 6,000, 7,000 series aluminum extrusions are, have great chip breaking uh, capabilities so we can achieve tight tolerances through CNC and, and cutting. Uh, we look at uh, joinable, uh, very, very different ways of joining aluminum. It can be welded, adhesive, bonded, bolts, rivets, uh, many different applications. We'll talk a little bit more on joining as well later on in the presentation. And uh, it's virtually seamless. Again, back to that hollow, the material flows around that mandrel, squeezes and everything back together, and the material will come out as, a, as a, basically a, a seamless tube as it exits the press. And lastly here, we look at the uh, sort of the economical advantages of aluminum extrusion. We look at, at tooling, aluminum extrusion, uh, die tooling ranges from $500 to $5,000. It really depends on the size of the profile that you're making and the complexity of that. But in comparison to roll forming, uh, tooling, die casting, injection molding, it's considerably less. So it allows uh, for being able to come up with more effective tooling at a, at a lower rate for, uh, and, and also if you look at the, the time and how effective time management is from an extrusion standpoint, die tooling can be done in, in anywhere from two to four weeks where some of the other roll forming and die castings and injection moldings can take upwards of uh, 16 to 20 weeks. So it allows us to get to production and prototyping a lot quicker by having these, uh, these short lead times for tooling. Uh, some just some general applications of, of different types of aluminum extrusions. You can see heat sinks, uh, medical industry, uh, architectural industry, obviously automotive industry. Um, I'm not sure if everyone's aware, but the new iPhone or sorry iWatch uh, Sport is an aluminum extrusion, and uh, and also the uh, this new Cadillac here. Uh, a little bit here on sustainability. Uh, as we all know that uh, aluminum extrusions can be recycled uh, without any uh, uh, degradation. So uh, there's nothing we can be recycled over and over and over again without any deterioration of the aluminum. Uh, recycling uh, only requires 8% of the energy necessary to, pervert, to produce virgin aluminum. And then extrusions can also contain as much as 80% uh, as of re recycled content. And then uh, we have, uh, yeah, so, we, so in regards to meeting the mechanical properties and, uh, and, and that sort of thing. So next, uh, next slide here, uh, just a little bit more on sustainability uh, and what is recycled content and what isn't recycled content. Um, many perceptions are recycled content is, uh, is a scrap truck uh, with some material in the back, and, and unfortunately, it, it, or fortunately enough, it's not. It's uh, on, a much, on a much bigger level. Uh, we see here uh, a scrap truck here moving aluminum extrusion profiles, uh, and you can see there the, uh, the feedstock here of prime versus uh, processed scrap. Uh, just looking here now at uh, the next portion of our uh, presentation on the key design uh, variables. 
And uh, with regards to aluminum extrusions, we'll look at alloys, shapes, geometry, and fabrication. Uh, now, looking specifically at alloys themselves, aluminum extrusions range from uh, 1,000 series up to 7,000 series, and, and mainly for the automotive market, we see uh, it being used heavily here, this 6,000 series, because of its good strength, good corrosion resistance, machinability, weldability, and formability. So we'll look a little bit more in depth of 6,000 series aluminum for, uh, for these automotive applications. Um, we look here, you can see that 96% uh, there of, of, of extrusion applications. And then uh, this chart here shows uh, the breakdown of the percentage of magnesium and silicone in here uh, with regards to the strength of the aluminum. So the 6082s, which would be more on the high strength of the 6000 series aluminum. And then you have the mid strength uh, 6000 series 6005A and the 6061 as well as the uh, 6063 profiles. And you can see there the 6082's uh, typical applications. There are intrusion beams, bumper beams, some chassis components, uh, 6061, 6005A, uh, more on the chassis structural side of things. And also some of the 6063 material. And we'll get into an application here a little later where 6063 is used for a chassis application. And then the lower end of the 6063, uh, material, you see that trim uh, components as well as heat sinks and electronic housings. Uh, from an extrudability standpoint, the material here you see uh, like 6000 series, 6063, uh, extrudability on the extrudability index is 100%, so it means it extrudes very well. And then as you kind of go towards the left of this chart, the extrudability goes down, but obviously the strength goes up. So you can see the relationship there of 6000 series versus 7000 series uh, aluminum. Uh, so this is this is just about sort of what what the composition is of aluminum extrusion. Uh, so if you look at a 6000 or 6063 aluminum extrusion, you can see there the total alloying elements of 1.43 percent. So uh, fairly low in in the percentage of uh, of the overall makeup of the extrusion. Um, and as you go uh, to more structural or, or uh, higher yield and tensile, those alloying elements are, are slightly, only slightly increased, and, uh, but it can provide considerable uh, increase in, in yield and, and tensile properties of aluminum extrusion. And then when we compare to 7004 series, uh, you can see there that with, with some, some fairly heavier increases, especially on the, uh, the magnesium and zinc side of things, we can, uh, can get some good mechanical properties on the uh, 7000 series aluminum. Uh, a little bit more on, on extrudability of 6000 series versus uh, 7000 series. Uh, you can see here from the top uh, on the left-hand side column, 60-60-60-63, fairly uh, moderate yield strength. And then as we work down, we see the increase of, uh, of yield. But then if we look further to the left-hand side, or sorry, to the right-hand side of the column, we see the extrudability is good for 60-63, but then is only half of, of that uh, for the uh, 7000 series. And also, the harder alloy that you're trying to push, the more quenching you have to do. And the quenching can sometimes lead into areas where you have more uh, tolerance uh, variability. So uh, tighter tolerance is more on the, six, the, the easier 6000 series pushing die, the 6063s, and then the 6082s may have less, uh, a little bit more variation because we do have to, uh, to quench a lot uh, more demanding in those, in those cases. Uh, this slide here looks at, uh, at a 5083 aluminum uh, extrusion. Uh, 5000 series was, is primarily used today for marine applications. And we're starting to see it roll to uh, automotive applications. It has excellent, uh, excellent for uh, laser welding applications. Uh, if we compare it to, uh, from a mechanical standpoint, to a 6082, material, it's very comparable to those high strength 6000 series aluminum extrusions. Uh, this is the case here where I, where I had mentioned that we were going to look at uh, a chassis application. So this is a case study done uh, for, that was actually, it's, it's a production part for the, uh, the Lotus Evora. 
and it uses a 6,000, a, a very uh, a 6060 alloy, and uh, the whole, basically the whole chassis and, and front subframe are all made up of uh, 28 different extrusion profiles. And what they really focused on here, and I can show you in, the, in this next slide, is, is we've got some very complex uh, part geometry, many hollows and voids in these uh, aluminum extrusions, very thin walls. And w the customer here, or sorry, Lotus here, was able to come up with using a very uh, the lower strength 6000 series aluminum with some complex thin wall geometry and, and be able to achieve uh, some great results for some more structural applications in the vehicle. Now, if we look towards uh, maybe some uh, getting now into more of the shape component and design component of aluminum extrusions here, uh, first of all, we'll look at just sort of what's the sweet spot of aluminum extrusions in North America. And uh, you can see here sort of the center of this table shows aluminum extrusions uh, in, and the, these are sort of the press sizes here. So if you see seven, eight uh, inch presses, we typically see extruders pushing anywhere from uh, one uh, square inch of area to up to 10 square inches, and the equivalent of that is to about one and a half pounds per foot to, to 10 pounds per foot. So that's a good area that in, sort of encompasses the more majority of aluminum extrusions for automotive applications. So uh, the North American market has, has a quite a substantial amount of uh, capacity and availability to work with uh, the automotive market for, for these extrusion applications. Uh, now we'll look at the uh, the key design variables uh, for shapes. Um, we'll quickly look at uh, what's the difference between a solid die and a hollow die. Uh, it's pretty self-explanatory there. You see a solid doesn't have a hole in the center in these hollows here. You can get uh, different classes of hollow depending on the complexity of the of the shape itself. Uh, some more good design practices here. When we look at extrusion, we want to design with as much uniformity as possible, keeping wall thicknesses consistent. Uh, we want to look at symmetry. We want to keep the parts uh, as symmetrical as possible, so that way there we have nice uh, flow through the die out of the press. And we want to keep our transitions to uh, to be very smooth. We don't want to come to any uh, basically abrupt changes in wall thicknesses. We want to have as clean the radiuses and transition as possible. And then if you're using the extrusion for a visual application, sometimes it's nice to have a uh, basically a bit of detailed design to the opposite side of, you can see here on the bottom uh, right-hand corner, you see the uh, screw ports and you can see that there's some detail on the back of that. What that does is just helps with the visual finish of these this material after it's extruded. Uh, even though we talk about trying to keep uniform thickness, symmetry, and that sort of thing, there always is ex exceptions. And uh, just to give you an idea of some of the stuff that can be done with aluminum extrusion, here's some different uh, profiles that, uh, that have been extruded. Uh, now we'll look quick, uh, go through some, uh, some case studies on shapes themselves. Uh, this is a, a case study on a gear traction drive, which uh, basically it's a housing for a uh, 250 horsepower electric motor that uh, b drives each wheel. Uh, and this is uh, courtesy of uh, a company called uh, Right Speed Powertrains. And uh, and what we look at the profile specifically that we saw on the on the other page is uh, so we've got uh, a multiple hollow profile um, with some very tight tolerances. And and in this case here the uh, the customer is using the rectangular hollows, which are actually serrated on the inside to, to maximize uh, heat dissipation. They're running a, a glycol solution through that, through those channels to cool to cool the housing, and then uh, you have the uh, the oil line uh, there, which is a small hole on the right hand side of the profile. But you can notice this part is is roughly five and a half to six inches in diameter, and we have a call out of uh, circularity and concentricity within 0.2 uh, millimeters. So it's very, very tight tolerances when it comes to, uh, to running these shapes. Looking at the next, uh, the next example here and uh, the engine cradle, uh, this is uh, a great example of a use of 6063 
aluminum extrusion as well as uh, adding some 6061 profiles. So you can see you've got some very, very complex uh, geometry, uh, structural looking geometry here that is making up this cradle uh, and, and it uses uh, a varying array. So there are certain aspects that needed a higher yield in tensile and, uh, and you can see there from the, uh, the front body mount and bracketry to the cross members are, are done as actually a 6063 alloy. So again, that lower end of the, uh, the uh, aluminum extrusion uh, 6000 series alloy. Uh, two other uh, great examples here of aluminum extrusion applications in automotive. Uh, we can see here the uh, the Ford F-150 extruded roof bow and the uh, the Tesla Model S. So both of these profiles have have somewhat similar geometry, basically two hollows and a flange. Uh, so so definitely great great applications for an aluminum extrusion in these cases. Uh, this next little case study here, uh, we'll look at the uh, we'll look at the Lincoln MKZ uh, panoramic retractable roof. Uh, so this is a case study that uh, was very extensive with uh, with the number of parts, 28 components. It was heavy on the stamping side of things, requiring high investment. It also a lot of time and uh, manufacturing from an uh, assembly standpoint. So objectives here were to uh, keep the uh, assembly uh, cost neutral, to get some weight savings out of it, and then also reduce the re reduce the reduction in uh, in part count to reduce labor costs. So uh, the part, this is the final product here, and we see, uh, we see six pieces, uh, two extrusions and uh, four small aluminum stampings, uh, and then we ended up with 20% uh, weight savings and a 22-piece part reduction. So uh, what I want to look at here is the, uh, is the profile that you see on the, uh, the bottom of the screen where you see a very highly complex aluminum extrusion profile. You have multiple hollows. Um, and you look at some gap tolerances there on the uh, on the profile that are very tightly controlled from a uh, a tolerance standpoint. So 0.1 millimeters, uh, plus or minus 0.1 millimeters in some cases. So uh, some very very tight control over tolerances. Uh, now, in moving into a little bit more on the tolerances, so uh, the extrusion industry, specifically with regards to the extruders in the automotive uh, portion of the business, we we see that. There is a very uh, strong demand to push the tolerances as tight as possible. And in this case here, these extruders that are working with the automotive customers, we really understand this and we know that the standard tolerances are not going to apply. Uh, in many cases, we are uh, extruding at precision tolerances or above precision tolerances for certain applications. So it's just important that when you're designing with uh, aluminum extrusions, you work closely with your aluminum extruder uh, to understand what can, uh, for instance, what a metal dimension would be and uh, and what a gap dimension. So so in this case here, I'll just quickly go over wall thickness. That's 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 a, essentially a metal dimension, and also the base of gap dimensions. And when we talk about uh, a gap dimension itself, it, it, you can see there that it's bridging, you know, basically two portions of the aluminum. So control of tolerances is not going to be as tight on examples like this as it would be in in a uh, in a solid dimension. Uh, continuing on here from a fabrication standpoint, so extrusions uh, can be fabricated and formed in many different uh, wide variety of, uh, of, of examples such as bending and welding and, uh, and we can really benefit from, from how well aluminum can be, uh, can be extruded. Uh, specifically here, uh, we'll look at the basically the, the part progression of an extrusion. So this part, remember, was about 200 feet long on a table. It was cut back to an inch. Uh, we pierced um, some holes in this. We've coated it. We've added a, an insert into the part, and then we've looked at assembly. So uh, many, many different things that can be done with aluminum extrusion uh, uh, profiles from a fabrication and uh, assembly portion. Uh, again, uh, aluminum has great chip breaking capabilities uh, for high-end CNC fabrication, um, great formability for stamping and hydroforming, and can be punched and notched easily. Uh, now we'll look at a, at a bending application. So this is, uh, is a light bar for a uh, aftermarket uh, automotive application. Uh, what we want to focus here on is is the complex bending of some shapes. So we have a, a very intricate profile on the right hand side. We've got some high tongue ratios, and that's just the uh, I guess the tongue ratio is the depth of the steel to the width of the steel. 
um, from a from a steel condition. And then uh, what we're going to do is we're going to actually bend this part the uh, the wrong way. So there's multiple bending technologies out there, such as stretch bending, CNC bending, and aluminum extrusions can be bent either in uh, in T4 and T5 conditions. And what I mean by T4 conditions, and, and this is how this part was uh, was bent, is, is the material is going to come off the press extrusion, and we're going to quench it, and then we're going to stretch it. And then before we actually get to the temper stage, what we do is uh, we, we pull the material off and bend it in T4 conditions. So by bending it in T4 condition, there's, uh, basically there's no yield and tensile, high mechanical properties in this part. The part, however you want to form it, is going to stay in that position. There's not going to be any spring back or anything in the, in the extrusion at this point. So this part was pulled off, it was bent, and then it goes back into the, uh, into the normal extrusion process, and it is tempered after that to bring up the, the strength of the material properties. Um, in this case here, we used a 6063 T6 alloy, which is similar to a, 60, uh, a 6063 application. Uh, an important uh, note here on bending is that you know, there's always a lot of question on how long you can have uh, material, let's say, on the floor in a T4 condition before it actually develops some sort of age hardening. So. Uh, age hardening will naturally happen to the aluminum extrusion over time. The aging oven just really uh, accelerates that portion. So typically, if we can bend uh, material in a T4 condition within 48 to 72 hours after it comes off the press, that is ideal for the situation, and then put the part back into uh, the extrusion process to be bent after that, or sorry, to be, uh, to be tempered after that. Uh, now moving towards the uh, the joining uh, portion here, uh, there's been a rapid increase in the aluminum content in vehicles, and uh, there's been uh, a lot of involvement with the Aluminum Association, the Aluminum Extruders Council, and the Aluminum uh, and Aluminum Association to come up with a manual on on best practices as as far as uh, bonding aluminum, uh, welding aluminum, brazing. Uh, in joining aluminum. So uh, this new manual is available for download here uh, from the AEC uh, website, and you can get the link there at the bottom. Uh, with regards to joining, uh, there has been a lot of questions around uh, galvan galvanic corrosion and, uh, and what happens with the galvanic corrosion and how to control that when applying uh, dissimilar metals for the, uh, for the aluminum extrusion uh, process. So uh, it can be eliminated or minimized either by, by isolating the materials uh, from each other. Uh, in many cases, a lot of uh, OEMs are, are doing this by using adhesives uh, to uh, to separate the two dissimilar metals, and then uh, there's some new technologies out there where uh, using SPRs to create a very tight seal that doesn't allow that uh, electrolyte to get in um, to the area of the dis dissimilar metals. Uh, again, when joining and bonding these through uh, adhesive bonding, it's very important that we focus on, on making sure that that extrusion and surfaces that are going to be bonded are very clean, uh, and that can be done either through anodizing, through plasma treating, e-coating, um, to remove any, any dirts and oils and stuff that can eliminate the variations in the natural uh, surface oxide layer. Uh, lastly, we'll here we'll look at uh, we'll look at a case example here for um, aluminum extrusion of how it's replaced a, uh, a steel component on the vehicle. We'll look at uh, a pillar cover and a window guide for uh, for an SUV application. Uh, in this case here, the aluminum extruded extrusion provided a 35% uh, weight savings for the vehicle. Uh, multiple parts were incorporated into the extrusion because we could extrude it to the near net shape that we. We, uh, we try to do as much as we can with extrusion. Uh, we've ex improved the, uh, the corrosion performance. And one of the other big things here is that we've uh, eliminated any post-secondary polishing and, and uh, finishing of the, uh, of, the, of the surface because aluminum extrusion, if, if the dyes are, are run well at the press, we can achieve very, very high surface level quality of that extrusion 
directly off the press, so no post uh, post finishing is required. Um, a similar case here uh, for the pillar cover with 40% reduction in weight, and uh, the polishing of the visual surface has been eliminated. And then also with the formability of the aluminum extrusion, we're able to eliminate the end cap as as part of the uh, as part of the uh, uh, process. Uh, in conclusion here, uh, looking uh, towards aluminum extrusion, aluminum extrusion does, be does, does belong in your, uh, in your repertoire. We're seeing uh, extensive, extensive uh, use of aluminum extrusion uh, for many different applications. I'd encourage you to work with your aluminum extruders to, uh, to support you in design uh, of those profiles. Uh, we see uh, great recyclability and uh, and reducing the carbon footprint for those uh, for those aluminum extrusions as well as you can see these very unique uh, unique applications of extrusions here and uh, we can definitely help deliver credible fuel and emission savings uh, in today's industry so uh, with that I would like to uh, provide a little bit more information here on the AEC website where you can go in and find extruders that would be uh, uh, best suited to support you in your design. Um, there also is the uh, aluminum design manual out there, and uh, all this can be uh, found on the, uh, the AEC website. And uh, with that, I'd like to turn it back over to uh, Lisa, and thank you very much. Oh, and thank you, Rob. That was an excellent presentation. It's time now for our audience Q&A. You may submit questions by using the Ask a Question box on the screen. Joining us for the Q&A is Matthias Kapp, the Engineering Manager for Automotive at SAPA's North American Technical Center. Hello, Matthias. You have the first question. Someone in our audience wants to know, can an aluminum extrusion be sized to tighter tolerances? For instance, can a 70 millimeter diameter be cut to a length of 16 millimeters, size to plus or minus 0 0.03 on the diameter. Matthias? Hi, Lisa. Um, the question related to, to the diameter here, what we, what we would have to see is actually the, the whole design, the very tight tolerance that's requested here. Um, it might not be possible, but we would have to look through that. I would recommend to work with an extruder and uh, go in, review the design, and see what the options are. Very good. Thank you, Matthias. Uh, you also have the next question. It's a two-part question. Someone in our audience wants to know, how is the ratio of pricing per, per kilogram versus steel? And where do aluminum OEMs find the business sense on a profit standpoint to consider migrating to aluminum? The, the question was the uh, price per kilogram is uh, hard to answer because not all steel costs the same, not all aluminum costs the same. So I want to take it a little bit from the other side and, and look at it from uh, what Ford has told us uh, about their vehicle and their logic about uh, going to a an all aluminum F-150. And uh, yes, while the body is more expensive, Ford in their press release it says that they uh, have uh, higher secondary cost savings in uh, being able to downsize brakes, downsize engines, downsize transmissions, downsize other components that further bring the weight down ahead, uh, on top of what they save in body and white in aluminum and therefore offsetting some of the on costs that they're getting with aluminum. We all understand that we're going to get a more expensive vehicle by light weighting, but we also understand find a way to uh, get to better fuel economy. And this, uh, this better fuel economy can be achieved in many different ways, and this way, one of these ways is weight saving combined with downsizing. Very good. Thanks, Matthias. Um, here's another question. Uh, it's a good one. What will be the aluminum choice for ultra-high strength steel applications, such as for a B-pillar? Matthias? Um, 
I think when we when we are we're looking at an aluminum design car, again looking at the Teslas and the uh, the um, uh, F-150s of the world, uh, we, we need to look at redesigning and reimagining how to design a car, and not try to design a drop-in solution that fits in the same packaging space and an exact looks exactly the same as the steel part. Uh, the solution will be very different in some cases. Uh, and will involve some creative uh, designs from the extrusion and the sheet perspective to uh, supplement the strengths to achieve the ultra-high strength steel uh, levels. Um, but by being able to have additional walls in there and create a column, we can offset some of these uh, disadvantages we have in strengths and still provide good uh, weight savings. Thanks, Matthias. Rob, you have the next. Um, you have the next question from the audience, and uh, somebody is referencing slide 27, which I just brought up on screen. Um, they wrote in slide 27, you identified that 7000 series uh, pollutes the scrap str scrap stream. So they want to know, does this mean that 5,000 and 6,000 series can be recycled together without any effect to the recycled material? Rob? Yes, Lisa, that, uh, that's correct, that 5,000 and 6,000 series aluminum can be, can be recycled together. Okay, very good. Good question from the audience. All right. Rob, you also have the next question. Um, how how fast, no, excuse me, uh, what is the design limitation on band radii of an extruded section? Rob? With regards to uh, the, it, it really depends. It's very profile specific. So uh, we have, uh, I've seen extrusion profiles bent uh, to, a, to a band radius uh, where we can see upwards of uh, half of an inch of, of band radius and then as well as depending on some of the more complex ones. In the case where I presented there on the light bar, that was a 100-inch uh, a bend radius. So the larger the radius, the better. Um, but I have seen bend radiuses uh, for extrusion profiles bent in, in, in upwards of a, of a half an inch in, uh, in, in diameter. More on the, I guess, down the length of the extrusion, that, that would be the case for that, uh, for that bend radius. Oh, very good, thank you. Rob, you also have the next question. How much does typical bending or a sweeping tool cost? And also, what about other post-processing costs? Could you talk about machining, saw cut, laser, uh, things of that nature, CNC? Rob? Uh, with, with regards to the, the the bending and the sweep tooling, uh, it, it really depends on on the type of bending that we are doing. Uh, if it's a de designated cell uh, where we, we have a custom cell specifically for bending application, that range is anywhere from uh, probably in, from an investment standpoint of 200 to sorry 150 to 200 thousand dollars for a bending cell, uh, and that would be a designated machine for bending of aluminum extrusions. Uh, uh, if we look at, uh, let's say, a, a, a roll bender where we, uh, a pyramid bending uh, type of uh, a product where you can have multiple radiuses, uh, that tooling is going to range anywhere from $2,500 to $7,500. And then uh, for more specific applications where we have stretch bending, such as the example I presented on the light bar, uh, that tooling is going to be in the neighborhood of uh, six to $10,000. Um, and then with regards to the question on post-processing, uh, again, the labor rates for CNC, uh, I can't really speak to the, the labor rates of, of processing, but uh, I, I would estimate that it's in the, probably the 85 to $120 an hour range from, from a fabrication standpoint. So it really depends on the level of detail of how much material needs to be machined on those parts or what needs to be welded. But uh, to say your typical labor rates uh, for, uh, for machining or CNC would, would be acceptable there. Thanks, Rob. 
Our next question is, how quickly can the 7,000 alloys be extruded? Matthias, you want to ask, uh, Matthias, you want to a- answer that question? Uh, yes. Uh, from the, from the 7,000 series, there's a very wide range in, in, uh, in 7,000 alloys. Uh, if I go to like a 7,003, which is a lower strength 7,000 series, uh, extrudability is a um, little worse than 6082, but it's, it's still relatively decent. If I go to like a 7046A uh, on the higher strength side, um, my suitability goes down significantly, but more significant in uh, doing this from a, the question really, I think, reflects what is the cost driver in 7,000 series. And the cost driver in 7,000 series is more along the line of uh, extrudability and die life. Um, when we look at die life of a 7,000 series uh, die, it is uh, in the range um, for a hollow, it's in the range of um, 5 to 25% and compared to uh, a 6,000 series uh, die, die is amortized in the price of the uh, aluminum extrusion. And that is a, a very significant cost driver. Um, the, the other reason is uh, it's, it's, um, the, stra- the scrap stream segregation is uh, much harder and uh, the, the scrap is worth a lot less. So therefore, uh, the cost of the alloy is much uh, driven up. So all those factors of cost drivers, it's not just extrudability. Very good, thank you. Here's an is- interesting question. Uh, uh, this is for you, Rob. For stretching during the extrusion process, is there a consistent thinning of the extrusion? Uh, yeah, it's a great question, uh, Lisa. So for the stretching in uh, the extrusion process, uh, the parts are stretched at a, uh, a length of anywhere from 60 to uh, 150, upwards of 250 feet. And we're only really stretching those parts in many cases by half to 1%. So um, if we are doing that very minimal amount of stretching, um, there is little to no thinning that happens uh, to that aluminum extrusion profile because we're not, you know, we're not we're not we're not taking that part and stretching it 10 feet. We're stretching it only uh, one to two feet in most cases uh, per the, per the specification. Thanks, Rob. Uh, the next question from our audience is: How does the strength of the aluminum roof rail on the F-150 compare to the part it replaced? Matthias, do you want to answer that one? Um, from from all we've seen in uh, in crash tests uh, for comparing the old F-150 to the new, uh, it uh, seems to be reasonable to assume that it is at least as good, or if not better, uh, because we went from a four star rating to a five star rating truck. Uh, it's really uh, not only a roof rail question, it's, uh, it's a whole vehicle question. So uh, in the vehicle in total, they seem to have improved significantly stiffness and uh, safety rating and then for crush. Thanks, Matthias. Um, here's an interesting question. Why is aluminum more expensive than steel? Matthias? Um, aluminum is more expensive for, for a few reasons. One of them is uh, primary aluminum is uh, very energy uh, intensive to, to get, and uh, therefore all this energy has to be paid for, and uh, that drives the price for aluminum. It's not really a restriction in volume. It's, uh, aluminum is plentiful around uh, the world. It's just uh, a restriction in in how much you have to spend to, to get this aluminum out of the earth. Thank you. The next question is, have you any experience in welding the 7000 series to a lighter series? Matthias? Matthias? <clears throat> I'm uh, thinking this is 7000 to 6000 series, uh, and that's how I'm going to answer the question. Uh, there's been plenty of experience uh, welding 7,000 to 6,000 series. Uh, the only thing that you need to be careful in the weld zone is uh, with the changes of the weld wire that you bring in with MIG, uh, you might 
cause in those uh, well areas, stress corrosion cracking, and that's something that needs to be mitigated. Um, please contact your 7000 series extruder and talk to them about it and uh, understand the risks. That's good advice. Uh, Matthias, what about this question? With this type of, with the type of growth that's expected, do you anticipate capacity constraints in North America? Um, extruders have been adding presses uh, to this point, um, specifically for automotive, and uh, there will be additional presses going online. Uh, additionally, the, the uh, automotive part of the extrusion market is relatively small, so uh, I do not anticipate any, any restrictions in um, providing extrusions to the automotive market. If there is more needed, there will be presses added as that is necessary. Lisa, it's Rob. Um, I can add to that. I think uh, a stat here that I think five new presses uh, dedicated to the auto industry have been added in the past two years for, uh, uh, for the industry. So uh, the, definitely the, uh, the industry is, is hearing what is, 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 is required and we are adding to, to that capacity. Very good. Thank you. Thank you both. Uh, the next question is, do aluminum extruders offer surface treatment to make them suitable for adhesive bonding? Interesting question. Uh, Matthias, do you want to answer that one? Um, one surface treatment that helps with adhesive bonding is uh, uh, to uh, anodize the part. Uh, it's very good. Uh, it's not the cheapest way of doing it. A lot of extruders do anodize. Uh, additionally, um, any kind of coating can be applied, like an allodyne coating or, or other similar coatings can be applied uh, with some of the extruders through external suppliers. Very good. Let's see, what are the most effective ways to eliminate gal galvanic corrosion when joining extrusions to steel components? Matthias? Um, there's, it depends on the joint. Uh, if it is a, a glue joint, a lot of the glues uh, will allow for uh, enough of a seal between the two components uh, to eliminate that. Uh, another way that a lot of people do is uh, an uh, e-coat. Uh, a coating that basically separates the surfaces. There's other ways uh, with tapes that separate the two surfaces. It's just very, very specific to where the area is and what the requirements are. Okay, very good. Um, here's another question. Uh, what are the key considerations when bending extrusions? The alloy, the profile design, the bending process? Matthias, you want to answer that one? Uh, the answer is yes. <laughs> it, really is al it is the alloy, the profile, and the bending process that will determine if it's possible. Um, uh, the larger the profile, the larger the radius is going to be. Uh, some alloys have uh, better ductility than others, allowing for tighter bends. Um, some do not. So it, it really is dependent on uh, what you do. Um, it also is dependent on which uh, state you're bending. If you're bending in T4, which is the recommended way, some of our customers bend in T6 and therefore can only have uh, sweeps uh, at a very, uh, very large radius. So it's all interdependent, um, and uh, the solution is, is not... It, the, the good thing about extrusions is that we have a, a large design freedom. The bad thing about extrusions is that because we have that design freedom, the answer is not always quite as black and white as we wish it to be. Very good. Thank you. Rob, you have the next question. What is the tooling lead time for an engine mount bracket like the one shown in your presentation? See the uh, the typical lead time for uh, an engine mount bracket. Uh, we're probably looking at about three weeks um, for a uh, for a hollow for a hollow die. Uh, solid dies can sometimes take a little less because it's uh, just typically one 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 part to the die, whereas a hollow die is about uh, takes a, sometimes a couple of days longer. So we're looking at about uh, 15 business days to get uh, to get a, a tool made up similar to that engine mount bracket. Very good. And with that, we're at the end of our webcast. I want to thank Rob Nelson and Matthias Kapp for being with us today.
I also thank our audience for joining us. A survey will pop up on everyone's screen at the conclusion of our webcast. Please tell us what you thought of our program by answering its three short questions. This webcast will be archived and available for viewing on the SAE website. An email will be sent to everyone who registered for today's program as soon as the archive is ready. In addition, a PDF of today's PowerPoint slides may be downloaded by clicking the link under Event Resources on the left-hand side of your screen. I'm Lisa Riga with SA International. Thanks for joining us.